Welcome back to the next Moto Champion Talk Show. This interview is brought to you by TAW Performance. He had an outstanding weekend at Aragon in World Super Sport where he battled it out until the very end and took it second place on the podium. We're proud to have him as a member of the next Moto Champion Cycling team, calling all the way from South Africa for the first time. Let us welcome to you World Super Sports number 32, Sheridan Rias. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Daniel, I appreciate uh, being on the show. Thanks for calling in. I appreciate it. Um, so, like I said, you're a first timer. We're going to focus on getting to know you a little bit better later in the show. But since it's fresh, we want to start with your podium finish from the weekend. You battled all the way to the end of the race. Talk about your battle for second place. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a good weekend overall. We started off really hot on the pace. So we knew we could do something good in the race. And uh, I planned to try and run away but you know at the, in that class specifically it's it's really challenging to ever get away so um, instead I've managed to set the pace a little bit for the race and um, although we had a group of guys there it was I tried to stay at the front as much as I could and I mean I managed to stay there and uh, right at the end just missed it um, by, by a tenth of a second so I mean happy enough anyway but um, it was a good race nonetheless. Right, and uh, at the very end of the race, it was Lucas Mahias who ended up taking the win. But talk about that podium celebration, how good it must feel to be back up on the box. Yeah, definitely. It's been a while since I've had a trophy, but um, I mean, in the Moto America, I had a, I had a good time and, and we had some podiums in that. But um, yeah, back in the World Championship and a, a great way to, to be on the podium at the third round of the 2017 Championship. So um, now back on the on the podium obviously it felt amazing good to give back to Yamaha and to the team and uh, looking forward to the rest of the year where we hope to challenge um, for the wins uh, more often. Right so let's talk about 2017 for you you're back in the paddock in the World Superbike paddock by way of World Supersport with this Calio racing team uh, you missed a few seasons but talk about being back and how it came together for you. Yeah uh, it's awesome to be back I mean obviously everyone aspires to be in world championships so I mean, although I um, missed a few years being with me being in the Moto America and the World Endurance Championship, um, it, it was nice to get a ride back in the World Championship and to be back with all the people that I met at the beginning of my career um, internationally. So, um, I mean, obviously with my relationship with Yamaha over the past few years, that's how this came about. And I'm, I'm grateful to them, firstly, to for giving me this opportunity and then Secondly, they're doing a great job for me and um, providing me with really good machinery. Well, I'm sure they're grateful to have you on the team and getting a third or a podium finish rather three rounds in uh, absolutely helps. And talk about being teammates with Nikki Tooley. Yeah, um, Nikki's a, a young guy and uh, really talented, definitely really talented. Um, he's, he's managed by some, some serious people from the GP paddock, so there's definitely some high hopes for his future. And, um, you know, the whole team is Finnish, obviously he's Finnish too. And different, different people, but really good. Um, really hardworking and uh, a quiet crowd. So um, I'm the life of the party in the pit lane with them, which is which hasn't been the case with other teams. So um, really good guy, and the whole the whole team pretty much were built around Nikki. So um, they're like a big family, to be honest, and they've accepted me in there. So it's been good. I was going to ask, then how do you as a South African fit in there? But you answered that uh, question perfectly. Um, so talk about some of the adjustments you're having to make. You're one of the most seasoned riders in the World Superbike Series. You've been there since 2006. Now you're back in the World Super Sport class. How are you having to adjust to any of the new regulations, uh, just being back in Super Sport in general? Yeah, um, I mean, I think World Superbike have made some really uh, big steps forward um, with regards to rules. So they've made all the classes, particularly the super sport class, they've, they've, brought, they've made it way more standard. So um, it's a lot more effective in getting everybody competitive. And I think it's a, a huge step forward. So even the smaller teams like Akalia Racing or, or any team in the paddock has a, a fighting chance. So this is definitely a huge step forward. And I mean, although it takes some adjusting to because there's a lot less electronic aid and, and these things, I think it's a, a great idea and it, it gets everybody competitive. 
Right, and we see you out there battling with American P.J. Jacobson, who we love to see uh, racing, and he said some similar things about the class in general. Uh, you're sitting in third now, going into the fourth round, which is the Dutch round at the end of the month, and we wanted to get you on and obviously congratulate you on your really strong finish at the last round. I have kind of a fun question for you. We've seen riders ride with one leg off, the inside leg, the outside leg going into a turn. You ride with both legs off. What's that all about? Yeah, I get asked that pretty often. I mean, in the Motor America, Taylor Knapp also does it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's pretty different, but I, I honestly, I can't say exactly what it is. I guess it's like a, a balance thing um, that goes with my short legs that I guess they don't fit, uh, <laughs> fit onto the pegs enough. So I'm, I'm not sure what it is. I think just from the G-forces going forward, it um, forces my legs off and then they kind of just hang out there. <laughs> It's super fun to watch, a little crazy, but it's fun to watch. But Taylor Knapp, in contrast, is like over six feet tall. So the fact that you both have similar riding styles or, man, or you know, manager uh, speed going into a turn in the same way is pretty funny, but I uh, had to ask. So moving on, um, in addition to World Superbike this year, you're also doing the FIM World Endurance Championship. So talk about that. Yeah, I mean, the World Endurance uh, Championship, I've been doing that for a few years now, and uh, it's extremely challenging. and. Fortunately, I, I, I enjoy training and stuff like that. And, you know, like with the next motor champion program, we've got bicycles and that, and I love that kind of thing. And uh, so the, the world endurance is extremely tough and I'm glad to be doing a few of them this year. Um, obviously, my focus is the World Super Sport Championship for Yamaha, um, but I will be doing quite a few of the world endurance championship rounds. And I mean, it, it's extremely tough. Besides for the hot pace and um, and all of these things that go along with any racing category, the, just the, the physical demand that, and the mental demand that it, that it uh, takes out of you. The endurance championship is really hard, but that's what makes me look forward to doing it. It's got to be a great form of cross training for you, if nothing else. Yeah, 100%. I mean, for motorcycle racing, there's, there's no better training than riding motorcycles. So, I mean, everybody does their own thing, whether it's motocross, all these things, but if you can get onto super bikes, um, that, that's the perfect training and uh, it, it, is a, it is a good form of training and you get so much riding over, over race weekend and with testing as well. So yeah, perfect training. Right, more seat time is always better. Um, so we've, we've touched on a little bit, you're super accomplished, you've been racing for quite a while. Um, you've claimed multiple South African championships in both Superbike and Supersport. And like we've mentioned, you've been in World Superbike for quite some time. You made your way to Moto America a few seasons ago. So how do you, as someone with worldly experience, say Moto America stacks up in the big picture? Oh, definitely Moto America. I, I loved it there. I loved the people. And I mean, besides all the things that I liked about it, the level was really, really good. And um, I mean, it, it would be nice to see, obviously, these championships on the same tires because that's when you, you would get a true reflection of their lap times. Um, but I think the Motor America level is extremely high and uh, it would be great to see people from that championship do wildcards because I think they shock a lot of people worldwide. Well, we enjoyed having you here. It's always nice to have an international perspective. Somebody who's raced not only domestically in another country, but also internationally like you have and at your level uh, to come in and race here and be competitive and also, um, you know, see where our guys stack up. Matthew Skultz is here, another South African right now. How do you think he's going to stack up this season, his first full season in Moto America? Yeah, um, Matthew, I mean, heaps of talent. Um, I think he got those talents, uh, those talents, um, obviously that's a natural born gift that he's got and he honed those skills here in South Africa with my father's team. So, um, I mean, he's, he's been working a long time and hard at what he's doing and I think now's the perfect time in his career for him to take advantage of all of that. And with, with the Westby team, um, they've got the perfect infrastructure that he needs. So I have no doubt that he's going to fight for the championship and I'm, I'm rooting that he'll take it. But um, another kid I'm rooting for, obviously, is Cam Peterson, also from South Africa, and he'll be in that superstar class too. Right, we've seen great things from Cam and Matthew last year uh, when he made his debut. And Matthew did uh, come on a few weeks ago and attribute his ride here to uh, some help from you. So a little bit of the, that credit goes to you, and hopefully he does well this year. Um, you had an, Ameri an impressive Moto America run. You were on the podium multiple times. You finished super strong in the championship, so we hope to have you back one day. Any plans to come back, or are you just going to set your sight on the world? Oh, definitely. I mean, I, like I said, I love the championship, so I would definitely be keen to come back. And um, 
uh, I thank to all the people in in the series that 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 welcomed me in there. And but like I said, I definitely I'll definitely be back. Just um, not sure when. Craft-CFM.com is your made-in-the-USA aftermarket parts specialist when it comes to rear sets, clip-ons, sliders, engine covers, and more. Woodcraft is the exclusive distributor of brands like Armor Bodies, Cycle Mount, and new for 2016, Hindle Exhaust, a combination of power, quality, and value that you won't find anywhere else. Find them all at Woodcraft-CFM.com. It was a good weekend for us, and the race... It could have gone a little smoother in a couple of places, but uh, it was pretty flawless. I mean, we we rode hard. The team did awesome pit stops and um, ended up battling for the lead right there at the end. It was really good. Right, and you and Danny battled back and forth the last five laps, which was super exciting for the fans. And he did a classic last lap, last turn draft pass for the finish uh, and out ran you by, I think, four one hundredths of a second. So super exciting for the fans. Great race. Second place is nothing, um, you know, nothing to shy away from. Obviously, a great effort from the team. So talk about the high note being on the podium with Michael Barnes, last year's winner, Danny Eslick, now three-time winner, and both of those are your good friends. Yeah, both those guys I've known forever. Danny being the one I've known the longest. We used to dirt track together when he was like 10 and I was 13. So uh, we've had plenty of battles, and it was good to, to have a battle with such a close friend there at the end. And, uh, you know, I I sized him up. I wasn't sure if I was going to catch him there in that last stint. And then when I did catch him, I was like, well, crap, I don't know what to do with him now. <laughs> but uh I kind of sized him up and I could see that I was a little down on top speed and I tried it a couple times just pretending it was the last lap but let's see if I can draft him to the finish and I could never get there I was about you know a bike length or half a bike length away from beating him to the stripes so I kind of came up with a plan to to lead it out of the chicane and then just go straight to the wall and hold it as high up on the wall as possible for as long as possible and Hopefully he'd dive underneath me and I could maybe try to draft him the second time. And it just didn't work out. I mean, I it almost did, 0.4 or 0.04. So uh, if I could plan it again better, I don't know if I would have done anything different. It was just the, the card I had to play and it just didn't quite work out. But uh, had a blast. It was fun um, and, until it wasn't, you know. It was about 15 minutes later after I got out of my leathers is when they told me we were going to get DQ'd. Oh, so let's talk about that. That was going to bring me to my next point. Shortly after, due to a misinterpretation on your team's, as they said, a misinterpretation on your team's part, you guys were disqualified. So talk about that instant, you know, disappointment and how your team and how you responded to that. I mean, did you guys counter that immediately? Yeah, I mean... I said, we've got to protest this or something. I mean, it's, it's just too much money to, to just let go through your fingers like that. So uh, once we kind of heard what they were talking about and then we kind of read the rules again in their rule book, it just, it just wasn't adding up 100%. And so they allowed us to put in an appeal and um, actually went the next day on Sunday, I came and, and talked to Kevin Elliott at the racetrack and was like, are, are we going to be able to get this taken care of before I leave or is this going to take a while? And he said, well, unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until uh, three weeks for the Carolina Motorsports Park event because they had to put an appeals committee together that incorporated three people that had nothing to do with the Daytona race. And so being in Daytona, they couldn't really find anybody because you know I finished I beat everybody but Danny so everyone behind me would have got a better paycheck if I got DQ'd so it's hard to ask somebody that got 15 to be objective you know, if I, yeah. yeah if I should be DQ'd because you know well sure he should 
then they'd move up to 14th and get a little more money. So. Right, it was about a $5,000 swing between positions. So that's a big chunk of money to be putting in somebody else's hands. And I'm sure they needed a couple of unbiased folks to make the, uh, make the call. So real quick, uh, the Azra CCS president, Kevin Elliott, said, Wes was disqualified for an illegal airbox air filter setup on his motorcycle, a violation of a rule that's been in place in CCS and Azra competition for a very long time and a rule that Daytona 200 competitors were well informed about. So if you could elaborate a little bit or explain better to the fans just simply what the discrepancy was so they were allowing they had a clarification on the internet on uh, the CCS website about Daytona air filters uh, for the R6 in particular um, what they wanted was stock inlet opening on the air filter cone and uh, but it just said what it's a real confusing situation but it said it needed to be the same model and make motorcycle and so what it didn't say was what year model make motorcycle and so we were running what it came down to is we ended up having an 08 model air filter in our 2016 machine and so but what was confusing was my air filter was the same as Danny's air filter, was the same as Barney's air filter. But just not on the same make and model. But their bike was an 08 or an 09 and mine was a 16. So, um, the, you know, the rules said that they allowed the BMC aftermarket air filter. And so they only make two that um, you can purchase from BMC. One has a trapezoidal inlet and then one has the normal oval inlet. And we had the one with the normal inlet, the normal oval inlet, and uh, it turned out that it was just a little bit bigger than the 2016 year model. And so that was the grounds for disqualification. And do you feel like that was fair? I mean, obviously not in the sense that you raced a really hard race and wanted to get second place, but do you feel like it was clear or there was definitely too much gray area? Uh, there was just too much gray area. There was, it didn't say what year model you had to have in there. Cause we, I mean, if we would have had question, we would have never ran that air filter. It was, it was something that the TSE guys had actually talked to uh, the sanctioning body about the year prior when they ran Wyatt Ferris. So they were under 100% certainty that they were running the proper air filter. And then when we go to tech, it, it wasn't. So it was just like jaw to the floor. We were all just stunned. Oh my God, I can't even imagine. And then your fans on social media, there was a huge outpouring of support for the disqual, you know, to overturn the disqualification that, you know, what a, what a devastating thing to take away such a great race and such a great finish from the team. How'd that make you feel with all that support? Well, it was great to hear that everyone was, was pumped on, on watching the race and I'm just stoked that it wasn't a runaway, you know? If you're watching the Daytona 200, it's easy to have one guy end up getting way out there and it's just a snoozer. And this was a battle to the end. I mean, minus the few red flags at the end, or at the beginning, we had a full-on battle the whole time. And so it was a good race to watch and then to kind of put a black eye on it by DQing, you know, a podium finisher over an air filter just seemed kind of kind of cheesy to me. Geico Motorcycle. Great rates for great rides.
All right, we're back in this feature segment it's brought to you by TAW Performance. Almost five months into 2017 and the wait is finally over. Moto America is officially ready to kick off its third season alongside the premier level of racing in Austin, Texas. After an exciting 2016 where four new champions were crowned, 2017 has a lot to live up to in order to meet and exceed the fans' expectations. But with all the familiar faces at the front returning, I don't think this will be a problem. So just to get you all amped up for the big season opener, let's start with a little Superbike rundown. Your reigning and now two-time and back-to-back champ Cameron Bobier and his teammate Josh Hayes will be back on their Monster Energy Graves Yamahas from last year. While Yoshimura Suzuki teammates Roger Hayden and Tony Elias will be back and already are challenging for the front on their new 2017 Suzukis. This is good and bad for both teams. Good for Yamaha that they're back on their familiar steeds. Bad for them because Roger and Tony already bested them on their new bikes at the test last month. Good for the Suzukis that they're already showing speed, but will this type of pace be consistent all year? Only time will tell, and with Jake Gagne returning on his Broster Racing Honda, and the addition of teams like Mean Motorsports and last year's Superstock champ Josh Heron moving up, the Superbike Championship could get very interesting, especially if you remember Josh Heron's Superbike Championship battle from 2013. In Superstock fan favorite Quicksilver Latest Motors Racing, Bobby Fong was out front and fastest of the test, which means it'll be a season-long shootout between guys like him and TOBC's Danny Eslick and M4 Suzuki's Jake Lewis. And don't forget mixing things up as well will be our recent guest, Yamalube Westby Racing's Matthew Skult, who's shown much promise after a strong finish last year and recently testing and finishing eighth overall. And on that note, we have a great video for you on Matthew and his team and why they race. Watch this. Like I say, I do surround myself with the best people, but they gotta be honest people. They can't be loaded, give me a load of crap, I won't take it, I know what the deal is. I've been racing myself for years. I was on the factory team at Honda for in the early 80s, and I know what the deal is, you know? So that's how I got started. And 2014 was our, went into Yamaha, I said, guys, I appreciate you wanting us to give us something. Well, whether you give us a dime, we're going racing, we're gonna win, me and Dane. And we knew we would, with just a, the attitude we had with Chuck involved and the other team, and we knew we were going to win. We knew, knew there was no doubt. So they gave us money in 2014. We went outside that thing, and we hugged each other, and that was the start of the whole deal. Now look how big it's gotten. Even when him passed away, his power, his whatever it is, he's got some kind of power. That's, everybody loves him and has continued this thing on, and I won't let it die. As long as I got a dime, it's just the, the fact that everybody's friends and, you know, we can talk about anything. We're all like family. It's, we started this in 14. Everybody came together. It always was fun in club races. But just me and Dustin, Matter, and Dane, just us three eating bologna sandwiches in that white truck I'm driving now still. But the deal is it starts with your own team. If all you guys are buddies and you're giving off this vibe and everybody just loves it, so they're all happy too. Now it's just a whole, all these professionals, I've learned so much. I mean, they may have learned something from me, but I've learned so much from them about it. I wish I knew half as much as I knew now. Back when I was racing, I could have actually done pretty good, I think, you know? If you had a Yosh, anything on your bike that's Yosh, it was a top class deal. I mean, just the name was, I mean, I was so proud that they would deal with us, you know, when it come 2014 and they wanted to be with us. I was like, really? So, I mean, I talked to Pops back in the day, you know, I went to the shop in California and we sat around. It was great, man. I had a lot, a lot of respect for Yosh and still do. And when they wanted to be with us, I was like, you damn right. As far as Matt's potential, I see the potential as being endless, um, simply because he's been in so many places and ridden so many different bikes and he can really take to a track. But the best thing about Matt is he doesn't really know his own potential. So he's kind of, I would say, maybe a little blind to it, which is good. So he can kind of throw caution to the wind and let it go out and, and let it all hang out. He's, he's not afraid to bang bars, and, and um, I love having him around. He's a, a sheer joy to be around and to work with. I'm just really thankful that they've taken me in as like their single man rider. They put all of their trust into me, and you know, it's a really good feeling that I'm there, like, guy, you know, and hopefully I can just keep that going all season long and just bring home the positions that we should be, you know, running up front. Nolan Lampkin uh, is from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, he's going to be riding a 600 under a support program for uh, Westby Racing. We're just looking to, not to groom another champion, but just to help bring somebody along. I think everybody in the paddock should give it a shot. This is my sheer 
goal is to uh, bring success, win championships for our sponsors, and uh, live up to what I know Dane would want me to be doing. And that's no lie, it's no joke. I have no other reason to, to be here other than to honor him and, and work with our team. Just want to thank Dane for, and I know it's him up there, keeping us going, I appreciate it. And he won't let me alone, you know? It's like, I can't sleep late, he's jabbing me. Get your ass up, go ride your bicycle. I mean, that's just how he was. He, he pedaled from Tulsa to Daytona Beach on his bicycle. I'm like, come on, man. I can go to the get and go from my house, but that's about it probably, you know? So that's what I want to thank. Thanks, son, keep it up. And look for Nolan Lampkin, who'll be joining the team in the 600 Superstock class this year. Speaking of 600s, Monster Energy Yamalube YES Graves Yamaha's Garrett Gerloff kicked off the test on top of the charts, notching a time just under his pole position time from last year at Coda. Garrett had a stellar year last year, going on to finally win his elusive championship. But with M4X star Suzuki's Valentine DeBeast and his teammate JD Beach just behind him, he'll have his work cut out for him to keep that championship in his possession. In your Super Stock 600 class, we have M4X star Suzuki's Nick McFadden, who finished the test on top, and he'll be battling JC Camacho, Brandon Cleland, Caroline Olsen, and more young Fast and Furious in 2017. The KTM RC Cup will be returning in 2017, but not until round two at Road Atlanta. So who do you have for 2017? Who are your championship prospects? Tweet us, Instagram us, Facebook us, and let us know. We can't play favorites here, but we can say that we hope each championship comes down to the last lap of the last race of the year. Watch Moto America all season long, in person, on TV or online. 10 rounds and one may be coming to a town near you. Or catch your racing on TV or online via BN Sports. I was, and then in the middle of that, you start going, you haven't messed up one bit. Well, don't mess up now. Don't get in your own head. Stop, t t stop talking to yourself. Focus on your words. At a loss for a blooper. I'm getting progressively worse. <laughs> Because I'm so cute. <laughs>